It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Hi, Rose friends. Today I'm with Connie Hilker of Heartwood Roses. Connie is a self-professed history geek, and when it comes to Rose history, she's more than a geek. Connie goes about tending the stories behind the roses and the roses themselves like she would a beloved family member. Don't you just love that? It is no surprise that incoming ARS President Bob Martin has named Connie as chairman of the Committee for Rose Preservation. Now, I can think of no one better suited. Yes, roses, especially those who have been around for a long, long time, are in good hands with Connie. So, Connie, tell us, how did this love affair with heritage roses begin? Oh, that's easy. You're a, hair, a history geek. Eventually, you start hearing family stories, and some of my family stories involved roses. Now, they were mid-century classic hybrid tea roses, so not what most people consider to be heritage roses, but they're heritage roses within my family because my great-grandmother and my grandmother grew them and loved them and passed that down. And I started listening to other people's stories about roses in their family. And then I learned about roses in cemeteries, so those must have been important to those families, important enough to plant them you know, forever on the lots and the graves of their loved ones. And there's no way you can't love that. Absolutely. You just can't. I remember the day that um, we were given a Harrison Yellow and uh, just a cutting from a friend in Tennessee. We live in Indiana and that cutting um, was from a shrub that had started from their great great grandparent in Ohio. But we found out with investigation where that rose originated and that was in Manhattan in um, the garden of Mr. Harrison. And so it was a, just a chance hybridization but it made its way all the way across the country. So it became the yellow rose of Texas, maybe, but it's definitely the prairie rose that's on the Oregon Trail. And um, so it's beloved to us, and um, we, we love getting to pass on Mr. Harrison's beauty. And uh, I will never forget the day my daughter and I were in Harlem area uh, when she lived in New York City. And uh, my friend Stephen Scaniello, I know he's a good friend of yours too, as he is all rose lovers. And he had me on the phone. He said, I, am, I have a surprise for you. I wanted to meet you there today, but we, we, I don't have time. I can't get there. So here we are. We're at um, the uh, Trinity Church. Mm, that's not the whole name, but it's um, something there in Harlem and uh, so we're meandering around a cemetery and lo and behold we happen upon Mr. Harrison's grave and both my daughter and I just had a moment and we, we felt like we were visiting a family member so I know exactly that feeling that you get from that kind of experience so so tell us about the cemetery you're most um, you're you're working in I volunteer to manage the rose collection at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. It's part of the garden cemetery movement that was in the early to mid 19th century when cities became overpopulated and you didn't know what to do with your dead because the church churchyards were full. Mm -hmm. So some entrepreneurs got the idea to start what they referred to as a park for the dead. And it's for the dead and it's for their families and it's landscaped like a park. 135 acres, mm -hmm. hills, streams, meandering paths. It's just an absolutely beautiful place. And it's a place that's still relevant now in the city of Richmond. It's consistently voted one of the best places to visit. In wow. Richmond, there's always mm -hmm. families there. There's always people um, walking their dogs. And families of the people who were buried there have always been encouraged to to improve the lots by planting things. And some of the things they planted, like they planted flowering trees, they planted bulbs, all sorts of heritage bulbs come up in the spring and the fall. They also planted roses. Um, since I came to this, I'm officially the manager as of 2012, but I started visiting there in 2005 and just took photos and took notes. and. There's so many beautiful survivors there. 
And it's a great way to know what grows well in my area because they're survi- they were surviving in that cemetery <laughs> with almost no care. I've heard someone say, if the dead can grow roses, then so can we. That is exactly <laughs> perfect. But oh. on the other side of it, they've always planted things that are, that are trendy, that Grandma could probably love, and things that were sort of ill-suited for living under those circumstances. And those we never find because they don't survive. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you told us some in, in your talk um, yesterday, you told us about some ways that we can get on board and help. So give us a couple of those. One of the best ways to help is to just network. Talk to other rose growers. What grows well for you? What do you miss? If there's something in your garden that you have that other people might not have. Share that. Distribute it. Um, it doesn't do any good in the preservation effort if you keep it to yourself. It's not your little secret. Mm-hmm. Um, learn to propagate. Absolutely. That's a really big one because I'm often asked questions, whether it's in person or online, so-and-so, whether it's a family member or a friend, has this rose that I really love. What is it? Often there's no way we can put a variety name on it. You don't need one. You can take a cutting from that exact plant and you can root it and it will be that exact plant in your own garden and then if you love it you can share it with others. Absolutely and you mentioned taking cuttings. Um, Rose friends I can tell you that on uh, Connie's blog she has a great article on just how to do this step by step of what works for her and maybe it's uh, something that will work for you or you could tweak her her um, way of doing it a bit to, to for you but it's a place to start. Connie tell us your uh, website. Um, heartwoodroses.com and you can get to the blog from there you can get to just about everything from that one location and the website is under reconstruction right now I started it when I had my rose nursery and we disabled parts of it and it's a little discombobulated but the um, the tutorial is still there and there's still instructional articles that I've written that are there great well, Connie, we're so excited about this, and you are the perfect person. Bob is right. You know, I see why he chose you, and it's so exciting to, to hear your passion. And Rose Lovers, um, we actually have something special. We have her entire presentation that she gave at um, the ARS convention yesterday. So if you stay with us, you'll hear the entire presentation. We'll be right back. There's more Rose Chat coming your way. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hey y'all, it's Chris Van Cleve. I'm the creator of the Rose Chat Podcast. For me, growing roses has become a passion. My membership in the American Rose Society has helped me to create the rose garden of my dreams right in my own backyard. I also enjoy the camaraderie and support of a network of rose growers who are eager to share, learn, and grow together. To learn more about membership in the American Rose Society, visit their website, rose.org. Welcome back to Rose Chat Podcast, sponsored by Haven Brand Soil Conditioners So now we join Connie Hilker's presentation on rose preservation at the recent American Rose Society Fall National Convention in San Diego. Heritage and preservation is something, as Bob said, that is near and dear to my heart. I'll give you just a little bit of background and you'll probably understand me just a little bit better after this. Tell me a story. Tell me a story that's true, especially about people you know, and I will listen to you for days. I started researching my family genealogy when I was 16 years old, Um, the last conversation I had with my great-grandparents. And I realized as an Army kid, I didn't know a whole lot about my family. So these people were my key to that history. I wrote down everything I could and they passed away shortly thereafter. So I've been talking to people and looking up records and doing an awful lot of documentation. I live in an old house and I've researched the house because we go back to number one. I'm a history geek and I'm really, really curious. So, And I thought, well, a house is about more than the house. It's about the families who live there, so I've researched them too. And all this ties very neatly together 
with roses and the history of them and the preservation of them because they're about a lot more than just the plants. It's about the people that grow the plants, where they came from, and the stories behind them. And that is my mission with all of this. I want you to meet my great-grandparents. This is Ernest and Vida Floyd. They moved to Leisure World in 1962, and those are their roses. I do not know what they are, and no one alive right now knows what they are, but my great-grandfather was a very tall man, and you can see how tall the arbor is over his driveway, and they were very, very proud of their roses. And here we have three more photos that I found in my mother's stash, because I asked her, I said, Mom, what do you have? Because we've always heard about my great-grandmother and my grandmother growing roses. I said, do we have any photos? And these are what we came up with. This one, that's my great-grandmother. That is her sister-in-law. This photo was either taken, it was probably taken in Oklahoma. Obviously, it's on the roadside. The rose is way taller than they are. Why are they dressed like that? And why are they carrying their purses on the side of the road? Nobody can answer that question. But whatever it was, they felt compelled to pose in front of that rose on the hedgerow. Here we have, there's my grandmother, there's my great-grandmother, and as I looked at this photograph, it's clearly dated 1954, printed on the bottom of the print that I cropped out of it. Does the background look familiar to anyone here? Huntington. Huntington. So see, it, it's passed down along families. My, my, great, my grandmother grew, this is my grandmother in her garden in Santa Ana. And my grandmother grew roses that have Hall of Fame names, and her very favorite rose was Mirandi, one that I have never successfully grown. I keep trying, just because it was her favorite. But I do, I also grow roses that came from other people's families. This is Silver Moon in my garden. Um, I got it as a cutting, or a plant exchange from a man who became a good friend of mine. And I found out later on that he got the cuttings from another friend who got the cuttings from the wife's grandparents in Arkansas in the 1940s. So what we have here is we have a plant that grows in my garden that, that has a history through that for my family now, but Barry and Leanne's family before then through Jim. And it still lives. And Silver Moon's one of my very, very favorites. Well, I'm also a, a hybridizer geek, and Walter Van Fleet is my very favorite, and I'm an unabashed fan. And families also planted roses on the graves. Um, I'm, the manage, I'm the volunteer manager of the Rose Collection at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. And Hollywood, it's 135 acres of garden. There's very little natural landscape in there. Over that hundred and however many years, because it dates to 1848. 170, wow. Over that 170 years, families in the bylaws of the corporation are encouraged to improve and beautify the lots by planting things. They planted trees, they planted bulbs, they planted shrubs, and they planted roses. So this is the Crenshaw lot, this is the musk rose, this is the plant that was discovered in the 1980s to prove that the musk rose was not extinct. This is Louis Philippe. Shortly after a storm downed him, he was seven feet tall. And he just got bent over. And he lived like that for a little while, and then we pruned him off, and now he's in much better shape. And this is Sofrano. It's not only old roses. There's modern roses, too. This was a group of the strangest mobile home, family, compound, community. It was around the corner from where I used to live. You see, you've got a trailer here, there's the hitch, they've got a porch, there's another porch on this side, but there's this red climber going up the trellis. This was a pink climber, it's up in the tree right about there. And then we have the most popular rose in America. A really beautiful Dr. Huey. <laughs> but in that same yard, in the front yard, in a very prominent position, this is what drew me into this property, was an enormous noisette. This thing was eight feet tall. Now, it was supported. There was a trash tree. I think it was a mulberry growing through the center of it. So it had some support to give it the height. And it was growing front and center in the middle of this front yard. 
Well, I put my boots on and I got my cutting kit and now this rose lives in, uh, in my garden and a couple of other gardens with friends that I've shared it. And that's a really good thing because the highway, pro the highway department owned that property and it's now completely flat and there's no sign. I can't even tell where the rose used to be. That's okay. We preserved it. It's not in its original location, but it still lives on. There's no way we're probably ever going to be able to identify it. And to be honest, I don't try. I'll get it in the class and I'll leave it at that, and I'll leave the provenance, and I'll leave the story. So, mine road and was that is how it will continue to be known. We talk about heritage, we talk about preservation. What is a heritage rose? Here's how I see it. So, American Rose Society, 1867, the introduction of La France. We all know that line, but that was so many years ago, and so much has happened since then, and so many things after 1867 in my book of considered heritage roses, so we'll get a little closer. World Federation of Rose Society is a heritage rose, and I love this definition. All species and species crosses, all found roses until they're better identified, and roses of historical importance. Closer. To be honest, my definition mirrors that of Stephen Scaniello. Any, a heritage rose is any rose that's been around for a very long time. It makes sense. Let's not draw lines. It's, 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 it's a heritage rose based on its history as a plant. It could be a, a heritage rose based on the history of the family that grew it. There are so many reasons why a rose could be considered a heritage rose. I came across this quote. Now, I read old rose books for fun because I figure if I'm going to grow these roses, I really need to know them in the context from when they were relatively new and they were popular. So I came across this in a book, not in the 1896 Royal um, Horticultural Society Journal. It was quoted in another book. And I really liked that because that's what we need. We need a refuge for old roses because one day someone will look for them and they'll become popular again. And it would be a really sad world if they weren't around, and that happens all the time. This is a book that I, I refer to this a lot. Georgia Tory Drennan was born in the mid-19th century, and she was a Southern woman. And she wrote specifically about plants, roses in this case, of the American South. Since I live in Virginia, I'm in the American South. This is particularly appropriate for me. But one of the chapters in here she calls it where they sleep. It's a cut flowers, however, however fresh and beautiful, do not possess the abiding charm of living roses growing and blooming. So you can imagine taking flowers to grandma's grave. Grandma would like it better if you planted a rose there, and that's what we keep finding in cemeteries. And she was very specific about some of her recommendations for this. It's one of the reasons why this book is so valuable she makes specific recommendations for varieties. Now, at least half of them are no longer available, and some of them I've never even heard of and can't find any reference to, so they were probably a flash in the pan, but they were really popular at that one time. So here she writes about noisettes. Noisettes, roses of South Carolina, and she's very flowery about this. A hundred or more tiny buds are born in the cluster upon each upright, sprightly branch and silvery white roses, hundreds at a time, bloom but a day, and then shatter. Every stirring breeze by day and night wind passing over the lonely graves bestrew the earth with a snowdrift of sweet-scented petals. It's a great picture with words. Now here's the picture, some roses in Hollywood Cemetery. This rose is about 10 feet tall. It's a noisette. It grows in partial sunlight, a uh, partial sunshine. It is Mary Washington, the rose that we know as Mary Washington in commerce, in every way except its height. My Mary Washington and every that one that I have any experience with only gets about this tall. That one is very, very, very tall. So we just call it the Richie Noisette, and we keep going with it. And in the case of um, Harriet Talcott, white Noisette grows like a tree, um, again, in partial shade. It's in the, uh, the shade of a large magnolia behind it. Wrong one. 
Here's a story that, about another Noah's Art Rose at Hollywood Cemetery that is particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, the, flower, the photo from 2001, that is my dearly departed friend Doug Seidel, who was one of my mentors, and he was one who really lit the flame in me. And I think he took pride in doing that and just sort of set me forth. That is a rose that has been come to know as Hollywood Pink Cluster. That photo of him was taken in 2001 by Peggy Cornett, who was at Monticello. The photo from 2008 I took when I first found that rose when I was at Hollywood Cemetery. In 2012 was when I took over um, as the rose manager there. So I met the ground supervisor, and he and I went around in the gator, and we were talking about roses, and I was making notes, and we got to that one, and it was cut off about 15 inches tall. I asked him, I said, who did this? He said, we don't do that. He says, the family does that. OK. So I figured out who the family was and got in touch with them. And I met them a couple of summers ago on the site of the Rose. And they were telling me all about their family that's buried. It's a very large lot. The elderly man's grandmother planted that rose. She, they figure it about 1900. They don't know where she got it. It's very similar to Blush Noisette, um, though I'm not going to make that leap and say that it is. And every year in February, she went to the cemetery and she cut it down. And then when she was unable to do that, she passed the job on to her daughter, who went faithfully every February and cut the rose down. And then it passed to the next generation with Mr. Davenport, and every February, Mr. Davenport would cut that rose down. And no offense to the men in the room, the way men do things, if you're going to do it, you do it bigger, you do it better, and every year it got progressively shorter. <laughs> there it is in 2016. It's about 12 inches tall. This is after I have tidied it up, because he would just hack it off. And then I would go back in, and I would cut out anything that was dead, anything that was crossing, and give it the absolute best chance possible to grow back up. As you can see in the photo with Doug, it really did grow up about chest high every year. But then we got a spell of bad weather, and it was very dry and very hot. And Mr. Davenport cut it even shorter that year. And in 2017, it was struggling. And by the winter 2017-2018, it's dead. There's a teeny little piece of green right there. That's poison ivy. Um, don't mistake that for live rose. I, I saw the green at a distance, and I thought that there was a glimmer of hope. Now it's poison ivy. But that rose was collected on that day in 2001 by Doug Seidel and Peggy Cornett. So there it is right there, growing in the Leone Bell Noisette Garden at the Center for Historic Plants at Monticello. They have been propagating and distributing that since shortly after 2001. So if you buy a rose from them, or if you've heard a rose from them called Hollywood Pink Cluster, it is that exact rose. Now, I have a, I have a relationship with the Center for Historic Plants also. I'm their, I'm their rose consultant. So I said, um, Hollywood Pink Cluster's dead at Hollywood. They said, here, plant this one. And they donated a plant, handed it straight to me. So when I get home, I, conditions will be right. I will arm up, get rid of that poison ivy, dig out the stump, and replant it. So there's a happy ending to that story. Now I need to get hold of Mr. Davenport now and tell him that I replaced it and not to cut it down for a while. <laughs> because honestly, it had been living since 1900, being cut down every single February. So there really can't be all that much bad with it. So I'm not about to disparage his, the treatment of his rose, other than the fact that he cared it to death. <laughs> so Ms. Drennan also writes of polyanthus, which is a class that is particularly near and dear to my heart. And we all know those are modern roses. No, they're not. They're heritage roses. So they bloom faithfully where the graves lie low in the grass. She's getting flowery again. And the rains of the season and the nightly dews are the only moisture they get through the long summertime as well as beside the marble tomb where flowers are carefully tended and watered the season through. This Clotilde Sopere, and I will confidently make, a, make an ID on this one, grows right next to the grave of John Knight in the city cemetery in downtown Fredericksburg, not 10 miles from me. Um, 
it's not a, it's not a plant from 1902 as far as I can tell based on it but it's been probably been there for decades but I doubt it's been from 1902 but it's still Clotilde de Sopair and it's still mentioned in her book so somebody must have been listening this is one that I found in a cemetery um, I it's on the road where I go to visit my parents and I always kind of slow down and take a sideward glance when I pass cemeteries. And I saw this tiny little bit of pink sticking out of this big hump, the clump of hosta. So I got off my cutting kit and I went over and I found this little thing. I had to part the hosta leaves in order to take that photo. The next year, I went back, it took cuttings, cuttings took, it grows in my garden. Next year, there's the hosta. The rose is down in there, but it's really difficult to find. And shortly thereafter, you can see what happened. And they're putting plastic flowers there now. So somebody planted that polyantha on the grave of, it's a married couple that, or that's buried there. But that's OK. This is the rose in my garden. I took that photo last week. But what I noticed when I put this slide together is the danger of attempting an identification based on looking at the rose in the field. Because this rose grew in a, a neglected, dry, shady situation. And this is what it looked, this is what the flowers look like. This is the same rose in my garden where it's fed and watered. And they don't resemble each other at all. Here we have another graveyard. A friend of mine collected this rose in 2006. It matches what we know as Shaler's Provence in, uh, in commerce. And when 2007 or 2008, he shared a plant with me. And then we were out on a drive through the northern neck of Virginia. He says, let me show you where I found that rose. And that's what we saw when we got there. Apparently, other things had grown up through the rows, because if you look, there's some rows here and some rows there. That's some tree. That's some weed. That's some tree. Now, I have no doubt that rose survived this, because the Shaler's Provence is particularly tenacious. So even if it didn't, that's it growing. The other photo is it growing in my garden. It's one of, I use it as a gateway drug for modern rose people for once blooming roses, because it's the first to bloom in my garden, one of the last to finish. It's fragrant. It doesn't get black spot. It has very few thorns. And it's particularly beautiful and graceful. So have I sold anybody yet? <laughs> we get out to rose rustling. And this one's not a rare one. And it's one that's really easy to identify. Around the corner from where I used to live in Spotsylvania, Virginia, there was this little grandma house. And it started to get a little overgrown, and then a for sale sign went up in front of it. And then a sold sign went up in front of it. And a few weeks later, they put a bulldozer in front of it, and I knew what was going to happen. So I parked in the driveway. I got my cutting kit. There's a lot of stories have that in it. Um, and I just wanted to see what I could find. And this rose was growing off the side of the house, off the corner. And I didn't know what it was at the time. And at that point, I wasn't particularly good at taking cuttings. But I thought, let me give it a shot. So I took cuttings of this. And once it, uh, once it grew and once it flowered, and I realized it only flowered once, it's very obviously Dr. W. Van Fleet. And to be honest, this is what started my love with Walter Van Fleet as a man and as a, as a hybridizer. And there were two roses on that lot. The other one was Shaler's Provence growing up a tree on the other side of the house. I've collected Shaler's Provence seven times so far, sometimes on the roadside. I gave this a program that mentioned that recently, and somebody put up their hand and said, well, your roadsides are way more interesting than mine are. <laughs> Possibly. Really, all you have to do is just look around you while you're driving around, but not at high speed. This is another one that I found. Um, it's a Gallica hybrid for sure, um, but it doesn't really grow like a Gallica. And what we've done, and one of the importance of networking with people who have similar interests and then bringing other people into the fold, is what I have found is five other people that I know have found and collected a rose that is identical to this one. So this had to have been something that at some point in time was in commerce. 
It's been found in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Virginia, Texas, and California. I call it Tidewater Trail because that's where I found it. Um, the one in Texas was a particularly interesting story because I was sitting there having lunch at a Heritage Rose event and a rose is dropped on my lunch plate. It's Stephen Scaniello and he's dropped a rose over my head. So, uh, I, an attendee at the conference had brought it wanting to know if we could identify it because it grew on the grave of her grandparents at a Texas cemetery. How did this rose get in Texas? Somebody loved it, somebody carried it with them, or somebody bought it. Now see, all I've shown you up until now has been old garden roses based on the um, American Rose Society definition. But it's not all about modern uh, oh, old roses. We have modern roses too. These are three from Hollywood Cemetery. This is Carefree Beauty. Um, it's particularly old plant of it, but that's Carefree Beauty. You can know that anywhere. Now, I'm stretching the definition here. This is Frau Karl Druschke. She's, pretty, she's also pretty easy to identify. And we had, and I mean past tense, had three plants of her at Hollywood. Um, drought and abuse from the former landscape staff killed them. But that's OK. I propagated them, and I have them. And as soon as the, as soon as the coast is clear, I will replace them, because I know exactly where they were. Now this one, this one humbled me. Because when I was first starting to go about Hollywood, you've seen the older roses, and especially if you're in gardens that have antique and older roses, they're pink, they're peach, they're white. In the case of, some, a case of the Gallicas or some of the others, they're purple. This thing's bright yellow. What is it? It took forever <clears throat> for me to identify this thing. When I was getting to know the, um, the former landscape supervisor at Hollywood Cemetery, I said something about, about you know, that yellow rose. She said, oh, the one over uh, Mr. Augustine's grave. He knew this intimately. And I said, yeah, what can you tell me about it? Mabel bought that at Lowe's. <laughs> Mabel is his wife. OK. But the backstory on that is the best part. That rose was planted when Mr. Augustine was still alive. Mrs. Augustine had passed away, and Mrs. Augustine loved yellow roses, so he wanted a yellow rose to put on his wife's grave. Now, it took me a while, and I finally identified the thing. I'm almost positive that it was autumn sunset, and I used past tense because it was really ill-suited for growing where it was, and drought and heat and abuse eventually it withered and died. And it's been without a yellow rose on Mrs. Augustine's grave for a while. So I, I thought, now that I've got some, a plan in place, I think I can replace Mrs. Augustine's rose. So I did some, I, I polled some of my rose friends, and we've pretty much decided that Julia Child is the rose that's going to go on there. I have the plant. I got it from Antique Rose Emporium um, earlier in the year and said, when I get home, I'm going on a planting spree, and three new roses will be planted down there, replacing ones that have been lost. So Mrs. Augustine will have her yellow rose again. What am I going to expect of anybody here? Because if we're going to preserve things, this can't be done at the top. It has to filter down. And there's little bitty things that everybody can do. Pick one. I'll show you some. This one's easy. If we shovel print something out of our garden, whether it's in the wrong spot, we want something different, we don't have any room, Share them. These are ones that I donated to our Rose Society last, um, last month in September. What we do is if people shovel prune a rose, bring it in, somebody else is going to want it, and we auction it to benefit the society. The pink one was donated by uh, Center for Historic Plants for the in case that temple musk that we planted two years ago. It wasn't looking good. They said, here, take an extra plant. Well, when it bloomed, temple musk is very double and it's very snow white. Pink. I don't know which noise that it is. I know it's really, really cute. So if you don't care about exhibiting it under a, on an exhibition name, it's a great plant. So we sold that one. The yellow one is Happy Child. It's a sport of one of the yellow days. I think it's a sport of Tamora. David Austin. It never really liked living in my garden. I guess I just didn't give it what it wanted, but I figured it's, 
It's exceptionally rare. Very few people grow it, and only Roses Unlimited sells it, and they only sell it sometimes. So I thought, okay, I'm not putting it in the trash. Somebody else will take it. And I just gave it to a friend. Now, what, I, my conscience wouldn't let me take money, you know, them pay for that. And then the other one, that's Easy Spirit. It was a... Uh, it, it was a, a gift that I was given for speaking at a symposium this spring, and I thought, this is great. I can take this little white rose, and I can plant it, and I realized I have a whole bunch of other roses in pots waiting for places. I know the Rose Society people will love this, so I took it in its pot, and they auctioned it. And so all three of those went. Now, we don't we'll probably don't have to worry about Easy Spirit um, becoming rare, because it's so popular, but you never know. This is another one that's a no-brainer if you're inclined. Learn to propagate your roses. It's really easy. Um, there are some that you, you never know until you try what kind of success you can have. And I can tell you from experience, when I learned to propagate many years ago, you feel like Mother Nature herself the first time you get a cutting to root. It's like, oh my God, I made this myself. And then you go off and you go forth and you propagate. This was a day that I was taking cuttings at the Center for Historic Plants. They have a number of plants there that, in the case of two of them, they're, they're the only examples they know of out there. So that is the most dangerous situation ever. So I said, look, I'm just going to duplicate your collection. They, they have a retail mandate. Strictly preservation is not going to fly with, with management. So that's where my volunteering there. Um, fills that gap. So I propagate them and I grow them in my own garden. So here I am taking cuttings at the Center for Historic Plants. I put rubber bands on them because otherwise they lose their identity, they're worthless. This is the kit that I keep in my car. It stays there all the time. Even things like sunblock, bug repellent, that's alcohol for my pruners. First aid kit, gotta have it. Reading glasses when you get to a certain age. Paper towels, Rubber bands, pencils, them. See, in case you have suckers, you need a spade, gloves, and water for the cuttings. You get to take cuttings from the roadside, from your friend's garden, from your garden, with a kit like this, you're ready to go. I did, what I didn't show was the boots. There's boots in the car, too. And we were talking about this at lunch today. Share cuttings from your garden. If you have a rose that you particularly like, share it with other people. Um, either invite them to take cuttings, give them cuttings, or propagate them yourselves and share the plants. That way it gets spread around. This one, this one actually made me a very dear friend. I put, back to my, uh, my fascination with Walter Van Fleet, I wanted to collect every Walter Van Fleet rose I could get my hands on. And the Holy Grail in the U.S. seemed to be best love it. He, he released three roses named for three Lovett sisters, Mary, Alita, and Bess. Mary and Alita are both in commerce. Mary's a little difficult to find. Alita is more e is easier to find, and Bess was gone. Vintage had one. They lost their mother plant. The um, Cranford Rose Garden had one. It was under suspicion of rose rosette disease. The one there was one was Sangerhausen, and they figured it was the, they thought that it was probably misidentified. There's a photo that was taken in Belgium that appears to match the old texts and a blurry black and white photo that was published in the ARS annual in the early 20th century. That's all we had to go on other than a description. I put a call out there on garden web forums if anybody had best love it. And Nick Weber in Maryland, Heritage Rosarium, responded. He said, I have one. We're pretty positive that that's what it is. And he told me the story. It was, it was cuttings that he took at the USDA black spot uh, trial grounds in the 1970s right before the place was bulldozed because they had stopped the program. And I said, Nick, how did you get to go in there and take cuttings? That's a government facility. He said, just depends on who you play poker with. <laughs> but he, he did have full permission. And he's a, he's a good Rose scholar, so if he tells you he's pretty positive that something is what he says it is, that's probably it. And I've, I've distributed this plant around. They grow it at the Belovich Garden in, um, in Texas. Ann Belovich herself grows this now because I sent her a plant. And based on what she knows the original plant looks like, we are as 100% positive as we can be that this is Best Love It. And it's been restored to the United States in commerce. Uh, as of right now, I think only Sydney Wade down at Rose Petals has it. But 
And I think it's available for sale if anybody wants it. So once blooming, it, it's a hybrid Wichriana. So I trained it on a fence. It's not particularly rampant, probably from one side to the other, about 14 feet, and I trained it V-shaped espalier on that fence. And that's what it does every spring. And it's very disease resistant, like most of the Wichirianas are. So I don't, I don't spray this. And this is one that's actually pretty easy. Look at your rose show schedules and see what you can do to be a little bit more inclusive if you're not being inclusive already. I will say, I, I took a pretty fine tooth comb to the schedule for this rose show, and I was thrilled. There's about 25 classes where roses you wouldn't just automatically think are rose show roses, whether it's shrubs, antique roses, climbers. It was wonderful to see. Uh, if I had had roses, I would have entered some, but we've had three frosts at home, so I have no roses. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, and this is an easy one if you've got space to do it. A non-judged a non educational display. This is what they put in Bermuda, and I love what the little plaque says. Roses that grow well in Bermuda. And then there's little tags on each of them. So people can come in and they can see in one spot roses that they might want to have for their garden. Now, the flip side of this is every year the Bermuda Rose Society has a rose sale. So if you fall in love with them here when they have the rose sale, you can buy them. How many of you use Help Me Find? Excellent. How many of you have never heard of Help Me Find? Not bad. Not bad at all. And this goes back to networking. Because if we're going to preserve things, people need to know that they exist. And Help Me Find is a great way to do that, whether it's finding information about a rose that you've never heard of before. I took the auction list the night before last, and I sat quietly, and I went through the whole thing, and I looked up all the roses that I wasn't familiar with, which I will say, John, was probably half of them. And you can share information on the cultivars. You can put notes in there. If you have observations about them, I have found them to be particularly valuable if I'm looking up roses that I don't know or roses that I think I might want to buy. What's great about this is across the top, I have found the little tab that says gardens and buy from to be the most useful, especially if there's not one. If, if the You can see that some of the tabs are grayed out because they, there's not content in there. If the buy from is grayed out, you know that nobody is, has listed it for sale. So if you read it's something that you want or you want to know about, you can contact members who have listed their gardens. Yeah, it, I, I will tell you, it's an internet rabbit hole. You can get stuck there for hours. <laughs> yes, I'll, let, let me tell you about this one. This is Classy Lady. No, this is Classy Sunrise. The other, the other one from my friend Diana is Classy Lady. This is Classy Sunrise. It's an exhibition style miniature. It is a sport of hot tamale. It was discovered in my friend Diana's garden. It's for sale from For Love of Roses. He's the only nursery that's listed. And the reason I put this rose up there is because I was updating my garden listing, and I thought, well, Diana gave me this rose. Let me you know, put, put it in my garden. And what I discovered is if you click on the gardens tab on Classy Sunrise, I'm the only garden listed. I know other people grow this because this regularly appears on the show tables in the east. It's a, very, it's a popular exhibition rose in the East among people who know it. So what's happened is either people didn't bother to put their gardens on there or they don't know that this resource exists. So if you look up Classy Sunrise, I'm the only one. And the only source is for Love of Roses. And there's my garden listing. It's listed as Heartwood Roses Display Garden. I used to be a nursery. So I put it as a display garden. It's my own private garden, but it was just too much trouble to change the listing. And it lists in alphabetical order all of the roses that I grow. It's a great way to keep track of your garden if you want to do it online. But it's also a way so if someone is looking for a rose in particular or who has questions, they can look at my garden and they go, oh, she grows this and this and this and this. And you can make a new friend. This one felt like a memorial when I did this slide. These are all of the nurseries that I have bought roses from that no longer exist. As I figured that's the only way I could accurately speak to this is these are the ones that I bought from that are no longer around for whatever reason, whether it was the death of the, of the principal, whether it was just the climate. I didn't put my own nursery in there because Heartwood Roses closed in 2012. And I'll tell you what, I've never been happier. I'll tell you that story later if you want. But this represents an awful lot of the bulk of roses that had been in commerce 
And many of these are now only available in private gardens because there's not much in the industry to pick up that load. In fact, Heirloom just ceased to sell minis. There's another source where the nursery still exists, but the class is not going to be available. Support the nurseries that are still out there selling roses, where we can trade cuttings back and forth. If it's something that you can go buy, do your civic duty and go buy it. I was gonna do this from the heart and I wrote it down and I figured it was better if I just read it to you. I was really, really surprised when Bob asked me to chair this committee. I, um, I do my thing in Virginia and it always floors me when people take notice. I briefly considered that I'm not up to it. And my husband looked at me and he said, yes you are, go do it. So I'm giving it a shot. Bob and I, we see completely eye to eye on the importance of acknowledging the history of roses, history of all roses. And we need to work toward a better understanding of roses for all gardeners. The genus Rosa is incredibly broad. We know this. And there's, a, there's something in there for almost every garden. I want to foster an environment where all roses have value, no matter their age, their pedigree, their identity, or their lack thereof. That rose that was in the, uh, the intro slide of this program, it's, it's a pretty compact example of why preservation is really, really important. That is on the Armistead lot at Hollywood Cemetery. Beautiful rose, most likely Duchess de Brabant. I'm gonna have to say that it is because I never got around to propagating this one because it was always doing so beautifully. Well, last fall, someone cut it down and it probably would have recovered because these old roses are very tenacious and it had been there for a very long time. But last winter was particularly difficult in Virginia. We had a wonderful, long, warm autumn it was, it was just the best. And then all of a sudden, the bottom dropped out of the temperatures and we were in single digits. So nothing had a chance to slowly go to sleep. And as a china, this thing couldn't handle it, not those little sprouts that it had, and it gave up and it died. But I'm going to assume that it's Duchess de Brabant, and I'm going to dig up the remains, and I'm going to replant it, and we'll care for it. So we'll carry on, but in the notes, that I, in the archive that I have, will indicate that it is a replacement and it was based on evidence of the, what we thought the identity was. But honestly, it hurts. I feel I should have done more on this one. That's Madame Joseph Schwartz. It's in Hollywood, too. <laughs> do we have any, do we have time for questions? <gasps> questions. Yes. I've been twice. I was there in the fall a few years ago when the Heritage Rose Foundation had their conference up there. And then I was their guest this past spring and did a program during their open garden. I've never been there in the spring before and it was overwhelming and amazing. Okay, because as you were talking about some of your unidentified roses, especially the Mosaic, I was thinking those might have been things that people brought with them in the wagon yeah, the one thing, the noisettes are an interesting one because when they were exceptionally popular in the early to mid 19th century, there were hundreds of them in commerce. And were they all the same rows, just given different names? There were just tiny little minute differences. But also, I've had three noisettes pop up in my garden as seedlings. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very hesitant to try to put a cultivar name on it because it very well could be a seedling that somebody preserved and, and planted. Ran into in the Deep South uh, recently instance where the show committee wanted to give everyone a door prize of a rose, uh, but rather than preservation, it was patent violation. So when you make cuttings and give them to friends, make sure the patent has expired. That's actually a really easy one to do. If you don't mind, I'll give you like a, my two minute thing on patents, because when I do my, my program on, on propagation, I spend about five minutes on patents. 
Patents are very, very easy to research. You can go, one of the sub-sites in Google is Google Patents. And if you go in there and do a keyword search on the registration name of the rows, which generally is the prefix, like AUS for David Austin and whatever, search that. And that will give you specifically the patent information. And a patent, a plant patent is good from, for 20 years from the date of application. 20 years from the date of application has, um, has elapsed, you're good. If you don't find it, chances are it's not patented. I had one more question over here. What's the best, best month for seeing those? May. Here? May. Holly, um, in the case of Hollywood Cemetery, they are on a south face, on the top of a south facing slope over the James River. And they're about a week earlier than the rest of, um, of Richmond. So mid May, early to mid May in Hollywood. The rest of Virginia is mid to late May. Yeah, most, in the case of the Chinas and the Teas, I took most of those photos in the summer. Because um, Chinas and Teas are just particularly well suited to growing under those circumstances where it's hot and dry once they're established. I think that's it. We know you'll want to check out the show page for today's broadcast for valuable resource links. Uh, that Connie mentioned during her presentation. Well, friends, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Rose Chat Podcast, and we thank you for listening. Until next time, happy gardening from your friends at Rose Chat. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.